Hello. Um, a, a good evening and a very warm welcome to you all. My name is Nicola Spaulding. I'm Professor of Occupational Therapy here in the School of Health Sciences, and it's my absolute pleasure um, to be here to do this. Our Dean is uh, on his way to China at the moment, so I've been asked to step in. Um, so forgive me from reading out from the script, but there's a, a bit of a resume here of uh, Rosalind's work history, and I don't want to forget anything, so I'm going to read that out. So Rosalind joined the UEA as Professor of Nursing Sciences in our newly formed School of Health Sciences in 2014, and uh, she was appointed Head of School in 2016. Rosalind is an experienced senior healthcare educationist and practitioner with significant strategic higher education and leadership experience. She has a deep commitment to ensuring high quality learning and professionalism um, in the healthcare disciplines, both in the UK and internationally. Her ambition is to ensure the best healthcare practice outcomes for patients through high quality, innovative, research informed education, which both challenges and engages students to realise their potential. Rosalind trained as a nurse at the Nightingale School of Nursing, St Thomas's Hospital, London. And after a period of working as a staff nurse and ward sister in surgical wards and accident and emergency, she subsequently became a clinical teacher at St Thomas's Hospital. In 1983, after a short break in service and time with her young family, she moved to Somerset and worked as a clinical teacher and then senior tutor in the then Somerset School of Nursing. Since then, Rosalind has held senior executive positions at both the University of Plymouth and the University of Southampton, leading on the development of health studies at those institutions during a period of rapid transformation. So with all of that experience, you can imagine that we were absolutely delighted when she came to join us two years ago. In her talk this evening, Rosalind will explore how healthcare education must adapt to meet the needs of an ever-changing landscape of healthcare provision. She will explain how establishing effective partnerships, influencing and shaping healthcare policy, and designing an innovative student experiences are all vital in this endeavour. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rosalind Jowett to give her inaugural lecture. Thank you, Nicola. Um, everyone can hear me at the back? Working. Um, I'd like to add my own personal warm welcome to everyone who's here this evening, especially to colleagues, uh, friends and family, uh, some of whom have travelled some distance to be here this evening, so uh, that's very much appreciated. Before I start the lecture, I thought it might be interesting, well, for my benefit, apart from anything else, to just look up what is the definition of an inaugural lecture. And I found a variety of comments, and I've picked on three. The first, that it's an opportunity to share achievements in research, innovation, engagement, and education. Secondly, that it represents an important personal and professional milestone in one's career. I've interpreted this as a reflection on the academic journey that I've taken so far, and also to look forward to what might be coming on the horizon. And lastly, that it creates a wider awareness of the development um, challenges and achievements in the world of a specific discipline, which in this case is health sciences. So the flow of my lecture tonight is on the following lines. I want to start with a brief highlight on the current healthcare landscape and what I think are the key priorities, and follow that by how the School of Health Sciences at the University of East Anglia is approaching itself and its policies to address that. A small bit on a personal perspective, on the context of where my career has emerged from, and then some illustrations of personal experience in how healthcare education has adapted to meet the ever-changing healthcare landscape with relevant education scholarship and research as appropriate. To finish then with some future influences that I think are going to be with us on health education, and last but certainly not least, um, the patient's perspective. So, First of all, the ever-changing landscape. So this is a brief idea of where we are now, and I think it's interesting in this sort of comment that in 2017 promises to be the word another, yet another challenging year. So those of us working in health sciences over the period of 15, 20, 30, 40 years have always had change in which we have to deal with. It's not new to us. 
Um, the King's Fund's commentary is interesting that says, a system already stretched to its limits will have to work even harder to maintain current standards of care. And I've highlighted the text that I thought was particularly pertinent, renewed efforts to transform the delivery of care. So schools and faculties of health sciences, and we're no different than others, I'm sure, in this, their, their main reason, their main purpose, is to transform the delivery of care and make it better, and that would be through research and through education. So sticking with the King's Fund for a little while, they've identified, and I'm sure there are more, five key priorities, and I'll come back to these towards the end of the lecture. So under the heading New Care Models, what they're referring to here is individuals to be more involved in their own care and offered support and information to manage their medical conditions. More care to be delivered in people's homes or closer to home. Of course, this won't suit everybody, but it is part of the new care model approach. Integration of health and social care. We've heard this for some time now. It seems to be slow in coming, but I can, I'm sure colleagues can see, um, areas of progression. Greater priority to public health and prevention, um, and that's something also that's been around a long time, but again, greater emphasis. The next, I don't, I'm not going to go through all of these, but the sustainability and transformation plans is an interesting one. Um, the text it can be misleading because it does refer to plans, but it also refers to structures which are relatively new, but in the pace of change, nothing stays new for very long. Um, sustainability and transformation plans um, refers to a structure that we're currently working with. There are 45 of these throughout the country. But it also refers to the plans themselves. The challenge will be how to move from a plan to implementation. Strengthening leadership is another one I just want to highlight. Um, it's interesting, again, not just in here, but in other analysis reports, that evidence indicates it's becoming more difficult to fill leadership vacancies. Support and foster compassionate, inclus inclusive styles of leadership has become paramount. And of course, crucial role of clinical leaders who may find the pressure of work um, overbearing at times. So, a little, just a little, on the School of Health Sciences at University of East Anglia. These are our three main approaches to dealing with the changes, the, the, the pace of change in the NHS. We want to provide high quality and innovative education for health practitioners and future leaders. A focus on specific health challenges through high quality research, research that's nationally and internationally renowned. And very importantly, from all our colleagues in the school, and we are a large school, advancement of knowledge through research and scholarship. I want to just pause here on the word health sciences because I'm going to go back a bit now um, health sciences as a title has been around probably, I would say, others may have a different view, probably 10 years. Up until then, it was very much schools of nursing, schools of allied health professions, etc. And certainly, I want to just look now at a little bit of my own background. So, as Nicola said, I, my background is nursing. I've got a few slides, and I'm sorry they're fuzzy because they're quite old. I didn't take any pictures at the time when I was there. But I think these slides will give you a little picture of where I and others trained, and indeed similar uh, hospitals throughout the country. So I was at the Nightingale School of Nursing at St Thomas's Hospital. I don't think the ward was quite like that on any of the ones I went on, but it gives you an idea. Uh, of course, Florence Nightingale. Uh, we didn't see her, and yes, I mean, no, I didn't. She wasn't there when I trained. But her presence was there. And I thought it was quite apt because those of us who studied what she did, what she said, the nursing care is very limited, but her political acumen and her networking and her building partnerships was certainly something she did, so slightly ahead of her time. I quite like this picture. I didn't see this when I went for an interview. You don't see it when you go the other side of it, but St. Thomas's Hospital is right on the banks of the River Thames. This picture, I think I'm going to get this right, the one on the, the right-hand side in the corner, 
I think is interesting. The lady in the dark dress, the it's blue spots actually, doesn't come out in this. What's interesting about it is that when I was training, the students went to the ward. It was a done thing that you worked with the most experienced practitioner. So you had time with the ward sister. And I thought that picture sort of summarised it. And then there's another picture of the ward. You can tell from the length of her uniform, that was before my time. <laughs> and then last and not least, I dug this one up. Um, we still meet up, probably once every five years. That was my cohort. Um, not many of them are still in practice, so that puts an interesting thing on attrition once you've qualified. So I just want to focus on the characteristics, because this is why an inaugural was interesting for me to think back. What were the characteristics of that training? And it was a training. It wasn't an education. It was practice-focused and patient-centred. There was an emphasis on the importance for respect, dignity, and courtesy towards the patient. It was a training, as I've said, and it won't be time tonight, maybe, to talk about the difference between the training and education, but it was a training. There was a significant skill content and rehearsal throughout the three years, a strong taught element with limited research evidence. I didn't realize that at the time until later. And limited discussion, all right? So you were, you were taught and you were told and you absorbed it. However, there was significant support, both in theory and very importantly, um, I think for the future for our professions in practice. There were two other schools at St. Thomas's at the time, a school of physiotherapy and a school of medicine. And it was interesting that, uh, reflecting that while we met socially, there was no interprofessional learning between those disciplines. Now, all of us, I'm sure, will have key individuals that make a lasting impression on our thinking and our performance and the way we, I suppose, move through our career. And I want to, I want to refer to two. I come back later on to others that have um, inspired me. But there were two people, and both these um, are no longer with us. So Dr. Sue Pembry, and she, she wasn't a doctor at the time. Sue Pembry, she was a ward sister. She initiated in that period, so that I'm talking about the 70s now, individualized care as opposed to task-oriented uh, task care. She was inspirational. You could feel that when you were working with her. She invested time in students, and I was there in my third year, and teaching and leadership were her prime um, attributes during that period, and she was a role model. She eventually went on when she left St. Thomas's um, to do research and publish um, and made a career in nursing. But I was also fortunate to meet somebody called Dr. Cecily Saunders. It was late in her life. She founded the St. Christopher's Hospice. I might be wrong here, but I think it might have been the first hospice in the UK. Fascinating lady. Uh, for memory, qualified as a social worker and a nurse and a doctor. She linked expert pain and symptom control with compassionate care. That was the word she used way back then because compassionate's come up now. Teaching and clinical research in the field of palliative care. And palliative care in that period, and I'm talking about the mid to late 70s, wasn't uh, so common. So, an NHS experience was important in the formative years of um, my career, and that was symbolised by clinical practice, leadership from the beginning, funny enough, and teaching, which I eventually did before I moved into higher education. Um, what I think is interesting that while there was a lack, in my memory anyway, of research involved in the curriculum, there was a lot on reflection. We were, we were encouraged and taught how to reflect on our practice in order to improve it. But then when nursing went into higher education, which was referred to as the incorporation of nursing, in fact, all the healthcare programs, um, I got a job into higher education. And this was a new experience. Uh, new challenges, um, new cultures, and suddenly, education was still there, but research, scholarship, engagement became quite important from the beginning. Teaching and leadership were still there, but in a different way. So now I'm teaching at module level, or a unit of learning level, at program level, and eventually at departmental level. And I suppose the biggest thing, and I don't know whether this would have happened if I'd stayed in the NHS, but the opportunity to influence policy at a wider university, national, and international level. 
So I wanted to give some examples, and this is the first one of um, my experience in designing an, innov an innovative student experience. Um, now, this, is, this isn't a map of future holiday places, although it could be. <laughs> So one of my first jobs with what's called incorporation, when nursing went into higher education, was with the Institute of Health Studies, it was called, um, at the University of Plymouth. Um, and the University of Plymouth won what was then referred to as the contract for Cornwall, Devon and Somerset. Um, my first role was to work with the individual schools of nursing at that time to bring them um, into the university and to encourage them to have one curricula. And I just want to show you where those were. This will work, yes. So I had to drive to Barnstable. There are worse trips. And some very good coffee shops on the way there. Uh, Plymouth, there was a big school of nursing there. Uh, Torbay had a school of nursing. Uh, Bodmin had a big mental health um, school. Truro had a small school of nursing. Taunton. Yeovil had a school of nursing and Exeter. I hope I've got them too. One, two, three, four. Have I done them all? Yes, I have done them all. So my task, as, the, as I was then the deputy of the Institute of Health Studies, was to go along to these schools of nursing and work with them to get them to move into one curricula. It was a task, I can tell you, but I've tried to identify the things that I learned from it. So first of all, working with eight schools of nursing that felt very proud of their culture, of what they had achieved, and they were mostly small schools of nursing. So what I had to do was establish a partnership and relationship with them, and indeed with um, employers and their students, in order to ha see what would be better if they had one curriculum. So established a clear vision and strategy, engaged many, many, many meetings with academic staff, students, and most importantly, employers, because employers were very wary. What were they going to lose? It was quite useful to identify the commonalities as much as the differences between these various schools, but eventually we designed and established a new common curriculum. You have to take note of this, Zoe, in the work that we're doing now, because there were 60 individuals that were working with me. It was the only way to get collaboration and ownership was to bring colleagues from all of those schools with me into meetings, meetings after meetings, and then a lot of work outside. But eventually, we had a successful validation, and we had one curricula. And I want to just pause and switch a little now to the political influences on nursing and nursing curricula. And I think, and colleagues may tell me differently, it was probably more pressurised on nursing than the other professions that we now, now work with. In other words, physiotherapy um, and occupational therapy. So what I've done is identified the sort of curricula, the government, the political changes that made us move. And the first one, and yes, the apprenticeship title is coming back in apprenticeships. The apprenticeship model was around in pre-1980s. It's certainly the model that I, and I'm sure some others in the room may have trained with. It was practice focused, it was located in hospitals, and students were part of the workforce. Then there was Project 2000, which has always amused me because it never happened in 2000. It happened a lot earlier. This was a major change. Here, the focus was on evidence-based practice. It was linked or located in universities. Students were supernumerary, that was a big shift to the workforce. And there was an emphasis on health promotion rather than the ill health model of care delivery. So it seemed good. It seemed the right way. But it wasn't long because, before it was quite heavily criticised. Employers weren't happy with the output. I think the students on the whole were rel relatively happy. But it was getting a bad press. So what happened? The government comes out with a new model. And that was known as Making a Difference. Making a Difference curriculum came out in 1999. This was very much more an outcome-based outcome curricula. Early practice experience in the program, that was good. Improved balance between theory and practice learning. Because the, the thinking, I'm not sure if it was the perception or the reality, was that Project 2000 was very theory-biased. And research obviously came into that curriculum. 
And there was greater emphasis on clinical skills acquisition, a lot more time put aside for that. And then, of course, more recently, we've had the all-graduate program for nursing, surprisingly, in 2013, fairly recent. The interesting thing here is that there were universities offering degrees, but they were small. Now, this isn't my text. I've taken these three lines from a government publication. Degree-level education will provide nurses with the decision-making skills they need to make high-level judgments in the transformed NHS. First of all, I'm not sure that the NHS has transformed, but secondly, I would argue, as others might, that there were nurses before this who were making, um, uh, making good and competent decision-making before the degree program. But it's an interesting way of trying to identify. So the education research interface is something that I certainly was exposed to when we moved into higher education that we didn't really have, or at least I wasn't exposed to it while working in the hospital. And the reason I raised this was that it encouraged those of us who were focusing on education to think differently, to question what we were doing. So I was part of a study that examined whether, indeed, the implementation of the so-called making a difference recommendations did lead to improvements in the confidence of nursing students. So we, we implemented a comparative study with some adult nursing students, quite a big cohort. I can't quite remember, I will in a minute, the number. Some studying the Project 2000 curriculum and some the Making a Difference curriculum. So these are just some of the brief idea of the findings. It's certainly the study highlighted there were important improvements in the confidence of students studying the Making a Difference curriculum. The increase in confidence is likely to be achieved due to the increased emphasis um, on um, the uh, practice of clinical skills and longer placements. And students studying the Making a Difference curriculum reported through the research higher levels of confidence in the provision and management of care, clinical skills, decision-making, and delegation to others. It was interesting that similar studies that we found with um, occupational therapy students and medical students showed the same. However, there was no direct relationship between the levels of confidence and competence. And it might be premature to conclude that students studying the Making a Difference curriculum were more competent than those studying the Project 2000. They were more confident. Or at least they rated themselves as being more confident. The self-ratings of Project 2000 students may have reflected the publicised criticisms of the curriculum they were studying. And changes implemented into this new curriculum were largely evidence-based. For example, the increased emphasis on longer continuous placement and on the practice of clinical skills. So I'm going to go back to this landscape, this geographical area again, because I was still working in that area. You can see what a beautiful part of the world it was to work in. It was interesting, after a period of time, that there was, we, we're all aware, so I'm trying to think of the date, I would think it was 2005, 2006, there was an increase in student numbers, a visible increase in student numbers. And learning in and from practice became the focus of attention for us as education providers, i.e. the University of Plymouth, and employers. And what I remember vividly there was the partnership we had with employers. Because in partnership, we recognised the importance of supporting mentors. For those of us who, for those colleagues who may not be aware of that, a mentor is a practitioner who supervises um, a student in practice and then makes a judgement about their performance in the clinical environment. Um, we recognise the importance of supporting mentors and students in the clinical environment. And so together, a new, well, it was new to us then, we established a new role. We named it Practice Educator. There were 24 individuals across Somerset, Devon and Cornwall, but not 24 full-time equivalents. 24 people, but all contributing a different amount of their time on this role. And so, having implemented it, and for memory, it, the role was established for three years in the first instance. It was time to do an evaluative study of it. And the study was to evaluate the effectiveness of this role from the perspective of the post holders themselves, the mentors and students. And both qualitative and quantitative methods were used. So, a little bit of summary of the findings from this study. 
There certainly was consensus that this role was an important link between the university and practice. Because one thing incorporation did, probably inadvertently, was take us away from the practice environment. The role was considered to have a high level of credibility, accessibility, and approachability. That's because these were practitioners. They were people mostly at staff nurse level. <coughs> Students felt that the practice educators were supportive and acted as their advocate in a practice setting. Practice educators, very importantly on this, supported mentors in making those crucial, sometimes difficult decisions about a student's performance in practice. They were a reliable conduit for communication between ourselves and the clinical environment across that geographical area. And um, they understood the reality of the clinical environment because they were part of it, or at least they were part of it for their time that they weren't in this particular role. And they delivered and organized clinical-based tutorials that went down very well with the students. Some more findings that came out of the research. The, there was an uneven distribution across employers. And looking back on it, I can see that that was naive, the way we did that. And consideration of what would be the optimum full-time equivalent to spend in this role, if the role was going to continue, and if the role was going to be rolled out nationally, was considered. And, and again, looking back at the paperwork, the, the end result was that anything less than 0.5, in other words, half their time, wasn't going to work very well. Participants felt there should be effective support there should be an effective support structure from both employers. And I've used both employers because I mean it's more than both. These were all the trusts, which for memory were about 11, and the university. That takes quite a lot to organise that. And they, they thought a programme of continuing professional development would benefit post holders. And actually, as a result of that, we did put in a module for them to study. And very importantly, consideration to develop the role to reflect the interprofessional agenda. Uh, it seems so obvious now. So, another further example of how health care education has to adapt um, to when the landscape within the NHS changes. Now, this is a change away from nursing. It's a change away from the allied health professions. There was a consultation document, I don't know how many of you remember this, called The Future of Healthcare Science Workforce, Modernizing Scientific Careers, abbreviated to MSC. This came out in 2008. It was quite interesting that by 2010, another document came out, so the pace was quite quick, saying, we've had the consultation, this is what we're going to do. Um, and I put this in the last sentence in because as a university, and, I'm, and there were many, we had to decide whether was this an area that we wanted to get involved with. Remember this, I'm now at another university, Southampton. It was a school and then a faculty of health sciences, nursing and the allied health professions. We didn't know much about the scientists who obviously were beavering away. We didn't know much about their program. But was this a program, a program that we should get interested in um, to broaden our portfolio. And we looked into it, and very importantly, again, we met with employers who said, please, we want our practitioners to have a degree, and would you consider it? And so we did. And we implemented and validated a program in 2012. I just want to put a bit of background to this. You know, modernizing scientific careers, why was it necessary to even do this? Well, again, this isn't all of my text. Some of it is from the, I suppose, the rhetoric of, of the government. But basically, the existing structure for healthcare science education and training was considered to be complex. There were 45 separate entry routes to training. Uh, and this new um, program, this consultation, or this decision, really, was to say there would be probably five. Five BSc degrees. And it was considered challenging for individuals to progress their career between separate specialisms. So a lot of this took place nationally, a lot of debate and discussion, and it wasn't all easy going. So modernizing scientific careers, as I've said to you, a new area for us to go in, certainly a new area for me, provided a UK-wide education and training strategy 
for the healthcare science workforce. Um, it aimed to introduce a clear career pathway that would be easier to work through, not just for the new graduate, but for people who are already in practice so that they could continue their professional learning at a master's level and to doctorate level. These last two sentences I have taken from the government site that said, it was informed with leadership and input from a full range of professionals. Well, I went to those meetings and it wasn't an easy meeting. There was disagreement, mainly because I suppose people wanted to stay the way the training already was. They couldn't see the benefit of, I suppose, professionalizing uh, this very important workforce within the NHS. But to their credit, the team leading it at the highest level, um, the chief officer, the chief scientific officer was leading it, patients, employers, and other professionals were asked to give their views. But you could see that the train was rolling. It wasn't so much, shall we do it? It was, how are we going to do it? And we wanted to be part of that. So all I've identified here are the five um, there may be more now, I don't think there are, the five main pathways leading to a BSc degree. And the one in red is the one that we decided to offer. I say we decided to offer, again, it was employer-led. So the local hospitals came to us in the Hampshire and Wiltshire area and said, this is an area that we would like um, more a graduate, graduate output and graduate training in cardiac physiology, respiratory, and sleep physiology. Now, we did have some colleagues in the school that could contribute to that, but we didn't have any colleagues who could lead on it. And it meant taking on colleagues, after we put the advert out, that were totally different, but added a deeper level of science to the school. And when I left, I think we were just probably on our, uh, they were in their third year. And out of interest, I keep an eye on it, on how it's going. Um, strong students were applying um, and they were, getting, they were getting jobs. And it'd be interesting to see whether UEA um, decides to go down this route. If it is, I'm sure the school, our school will consider it. We we'll do it, but we will consider it. I know I've got colleagues now in the audience thinking, gosh, where's that come from? But if, it, if we're asked. <laughs> so what next? I've just identified a few things, a few milestones, but that the whole world of politics um, for the healthcare sciences continues. And certainly, one of the classic ones that's in the press at the moment, it isn't, you can't read a newspaper or see the news without it, is the NHS funding and staffing. And I've chosen this because there was a paper um, that came out in 2016 that very clearly identified where some of the challenges might be. Because it might be so easy to say, surely we just need more funding. Surely we just need more staff. But this paper, and I would recommend it, talks about the effective delivery of healthcare requires decisions on the funding for staffing and the development of skills, and the deployment of skills, rather. And a, quite an obvious statement, perhaps. The quality of care relies on the number, the attitudes, and the skills of individuals providing it. The article explores the fact that what they think happens is that the funding is dealt with in one part of the debate and discussion, and staffing in another. And that this lack of connection is problematic. And I thought the last, uh, this particular sentence was interesting, that disconnect between NHS funding allocation and staffing levels plus periodic restructuring does not <laughs> enable a consistent and sustainable long-term view. And certainly those of us working in health sciences would feel that and experience that. So what are the NHS priorities that we're currently working with? Just going back to one of my earlier slides. This is a list of the main priorities that you'll see in any public documentation that talks about what we should be focusing on, um, and another list. Now, all of these are part of the school I'm working with now. They're part of our research agenda. We look at it, and they're part of our education. It's interesting that our research at the moment in the School of Health Sciences is focusing on three themes. It probably wouldn't be realistic, even if we wanted to, to do all of that on a research basis, but we are looking at public health prevention and well-being. We are looking at dementia, elderly care and complex needs, 
and we are looking at rehabilitation and neuroscience. So we've selected those three areas. There are sub-themes underneath that, but those are the areas that we're actually um, focusing on. And recruiting uh, and retaining highly skilled and experienced researchers to do that work. On top of that, we will be looking at how much of this we will incorporate into our undergraduate curriculum and how much of it we will look at our postgraduate and our continual professional development agenda. So the reason I raise that is that NHS priorities become our priorities. Now, partnerships and politics will continue, and you can see that that's a theme that I've been focusing on. Our partnerships at the moment and in the future will be first with the students. Student engagement is important. And I'm lucky I work with colleagues in the school that find this very easy. It's lovely to see it, that they listen to the students. We don't, of course, have to do everything that students want, but we're very student-centered. Our partnership with employers is crucial, and we look at our local employers and further afield. Our partnership with organizations and structures responsible for workforce design. That's a bit clumsy. I couldn't think of a... Um, a slicker word for that, but part of the change that we live with are that there are different organisations that ebb and flow that take responsibility for workforce. And we have to listen to where those ebbs and flows are and get in there and work with them. Partnership with other higher education institutions, very important, not always easy. One minute we're working in partnership, the next minute we're in competition. And what is interesting is the University of East Anglia has just joined a group as part of what's referred to as the Aurora Initiative, and we're, we've, we're, we're playing a part with that. So partnership with other HEIs, both in, both in this country and beyond, is really important. And probably very close to my heart is a partnership with public and patients. Um, nearly all our research and our education is very reliant on their input, their generous time, um, and of course the students have the richer experience for that. From the politics side, well, as some of you, if not all of you, will know, funding changes were announced in 2016. They come in this year. We're working on those. They're almost, it's almost a daily work for us at the moment that in this September will be the first intake of students um, without a bursary. New routes leading to professional practice are being announced and suggested quite a lot of the time. We as a group of practitioners and professionals decide whether that's what we want to do or not? Will it, will it hinder what we're already doing? Workforce requirements, we're in higher education, but we can't take our eye off what the requirements are in the workforce. Healthcare demands, of course, and I think quite excitingly, new ways of working. So when we can engage employers, we like to be able to discuss, you know, do you want more practitioners doing the same as you've always got? Or do we need new, new ways of working, new new models of workforce design. Professional practice is very important for us. Leadership and resilience has always been on the agenda, but it's never more important than it is now. Working with patients and public as partners in care and living well, and we have colleagues in the school who are expert at this. Evidence-based care, we are an evidence-based uh, institution with research at the heart of what we do. Um, and non-medical prescribing and coaching and supervision. Now, I put this slide up because in addition to the competency in practice and the ability to absorb and retain the theoretical that underpins all of our programmes, we believe our graduates will leave the School of Health Sciences with these attributes. Um, this is important because there's considerable debate about nurses, paramedics, mostly I hear it about, about those professions, you know, do they need to be at graduate level? What is the added value of being a graduate and a practitioner? So I thought it was important that with some colleagues we put down these principles so that it guides us as we design the curriculum. However, Probably the most important partnership we have is with the public and patients. And in the last four or five years, um, I managed to get a post, or it wasn't a post actually, it was a non-exec director role with a charitable organisation 
a national organization called the Patients Association, from which experience I learned a lot. This is an organization that hears directly from the public and from patients and from their carers and families. It hears when things are going wrong and it hears when things are going well. And while I was there, and I've done the role for nearly four, four and a half years, I was interested in the feedback we were getting, both written, verbal, and through the helpline. And there was a trend on what patients were saying. So I thought, this is important. This is what patients feel are their priorities. Whatever the policy agenda is, whatever the politics are, whatever the sustainable transformation plans come up with, patients want this to be recognised. They want to be treated with compassion and their voices heard. They want to be able to raise concerns and make a complaint without fear of recrimination. Now, that might be perception, it might be reality. Um, this, these are their words when they, when they contacted the organisation. They want to ensure that others do not share their negative experiences if and when they happen. In other words, how do we learn listen, lessons from sometimes unavoidable mistakes? And they want to be kept informed about events affecting their health and social care. They want to make informed decisions and they want time to discuss options when there are options. They want to be involved in decisions relating to their care and treatment. Now that's another point. Not everybody will want that. But this came through as a, a, a strong theme in our interaction with patients and, and their relatives. They wanted clear and timely explanations regarding delays in surgical interventions. That's not really much to ask, is it? And a clear point of contact for their queries and concerns and not to be asked um, over and over again for information when they've already given it the first time. Better intervention and facilities for palliative care. That came out quite a lot. Good and timely access to mental health care. Well, yes, that's been in the public arena quite a lot recently. And again, clear and transparent access to organisations' complaints process. They felt that it was blocked. It probably was there, but it may not have been as overt. They wanted to receive effective and timely pain relief, experience coordinated care, and be treated with dignity and respect. And although these sentences are simple, it's interesting that they, in this day and age, with everything else that we're doing and progressing, there are people that still feel we're not getting this quite right. And the reason that I wanted to include this was that we could do worse than to hold on to some of these sentences when we're designing new programmes. So what I've tried to do is give um, an insight into where education has had to adapt and change and how it's adapted and changed when there are outside influences dictating that. I've also tried to show where my experience has come from. Um, but there's very little that I've done in my career all on my own. It's mainly been with, with colleagues. And I'm particularly proud to be working with um, colleagues in the um, university at the moment in the, in, in the School of Health Sciences. But influence, inspiration and support has come from a variety of sources. And at the danger of missing some people out, I wanted to try and capture some of the people. And it's interesting to see some of these names. When I knew them, they didn't have these sort of titles, but they've gone on. But each, each one of those um, has made a difference, actually. I was able to watch them from afar, watch them how they managed meetings, watch them how they managed people, how they listened, and how they led in their various areas. And I've learned a lot, and I'm still learning. But none of this would have been possible, probably, without those closest to me. And I love this picture, um, which is the family. Um, fairly small then, actually, but since then, we've increased. And they are very precious, plus uh, extended family and, and friends. But without them, they tell me the truth, they listen to my stories. Um, even one of them said, don't worry about tonight, Mum, but do not make it boring, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> so no pressure. No pressure. None of them have gone into the field of health or healthcare, but they always take an interest in what I'm doing, 
And I feel privileged that I've had a career, a career that I've enjoyed. Uh, I shouldn't use the word had, because I still continue to, to think what's next. But also a family, and, um, and a family that's grown and developed, and some of whom are here tonight. Some will be watching this later on in Australia, and some will be watching it later on in their own home. So a big thank you to them, and thank you to all of you for listening. Thank you. Okay, well, here's a face from the past. <laughs> Don't worry, UEA haven't asked me to come out of retirement. I'm here because Dylan Edwards is in China, and um, I'm here to offer a vote of thanks. But before we do that, uh, Rosalind has kindly offered to take some questions. And uh, we've got about 10 minutes. I do propose to finish timely at 7.30, but uh, we have a roving microphone, and uh, let's see who would like to kick off. Do we have a volunteer? Yes, Richard Harvey over in the middle there. Thanks. Hello, Rosalind. Um, I'm really fascinated by this measuring of confidence that you talked about several times. And you, you must excuse my ignorance about the nursing profession, but I'm very interested in it because of this thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I'm, you probably are aware of, which is um, when you ask idiots how, well they, how competent they are at doing something, they say very competent. And when you ask experts how competent they are, they say, oh, I'm very worried about it. So how do you reconcile that in nursing? Because the idiots are presumably very competent, but are killing people, but think themselves to be very confident, but are killing people. <laughs> I think it's an excellent point. And where were, where were you when we were having that debate? It, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, my, own, my own opinion and experience was that decisions were made about that particular curriculum, which was Project 2000, very quickly. They wanted, um, they expected, and I think in some cases some employers still do, that when uh, graduates have graduated after three years, that they should hit the ground running and, and be ready to do everything. And of course... I can only speak for myself, I certainly wasn't. And I think it's an interesting one because the rhetoric and the, the public discussion was that Project 2000 students didn't have the confidence. Now they may have been quite modest, and I, I take your point completely. All I know is that when we did our study, and I think it might have been, I think there was between three and 400 students we did it with, it was interesting how and I don't know the reasons for it particularly, except that we spent a lot more time um, with them in practice and letting them practice the clinical skills. It was that element of their role that they seemed to have a lack of confidence and the students doing the making a difference. But what is interesting is that a decision was made at government level that confidence was lacking and therefore we need a new curriculum. Before we had really, there were some, there were some studies done, but not an in-depth study. But I think it's a very interesting point. And in fact, it'd be interesting if we did a, sur a similar survey today, how we'd find the confidence of newly qualified graduates. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to be treated by non-confident yes. people. Yes. <laughs> I, think I, I think I have some empathy with that. Right, there's another right at the back. Get the microphone up there. Keep your hand up, perhaps. Thanks, Rosalind. Lawrence Stenhouse's name was on, on the slide of people whom you um, acknowledged. Uh, whether it's in terms of participation, democracy, what is it about the dearly departed Lawrence Stenhouse that had an impact on you? He, now I must get this, the, the book correct, but certainly he wrote a lot about something called the process model. And I'm going back now when we were redesigning <coughs> curricula probably it was with the Project 2000. And we started to look towards education um, literature to help us design more formative and more student-engaged curricula. And his whole theories on process model, by the way, I never realized I should have done that he was from UEA. So of course, when I came here and saw the Lawrence Stenhouse building, it all came in. But um, his, his, his literature was easy to read, and we used his model as a way, what he was trying to say, and of course it wasn't about health education, 
but he was talking about education in general to say that the best way is to get alongside the student and not consider yourself the expert. Consider yourself the more experienced practitioner, but take note of what they bring to the table, listen to them, and work alongside them. And I can remember it, and it changed our way of thinking of designing curricula. So it was his process model of curriculum in particular. Did you ever know him when he was here? No, he had died before I came here. Right. But very influential, as you know. Yes, yes. And I didn't realise that till I, till I came here. Okay. Perhaps, I, perhaps I could try one, Rosalind. Yes. I mean, <laughs> it was a nice if you, if you If you look back at the whole transition from an NHS-based training program to a university-based educational process. Do you think it was right to move health science education into the universities? Yes, I do. Um, and I did from the beginning. I think how it was done might not have been the best way. But if I'd had, if perhaps I could have done it in, in, in my um, lecture. But the, what we gained by coming into higher education was, was time to analyse and study the research that underpinned our practice. I'm not sure we would have got that by staying in the NHS at the time. The whole ethos and culture of higher education improved our thinking. And again, if you trace back, it's very interesting to see the research in, in all the fields in health sciences, um, because some of the professions were in higher education before us, before nursing, um, improved. And that made a big difference. And the ability to critically analyse um, and to think differently, and I think it was the right thing. What we may have lost, as in all these changes, it's, I, it's everything or nothing. And so practice, that experience from practice, and that support in practice, seemed to wither on the vine. And I can see that's going to probably come back. So I'm one of those that think it probably wa it, it was the right decision. It was the right decision. But there was a point when I was in the minority for that. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else? No. Well, Rosalind, I think you've wowed them. So I'm going to move well, into the, uh, the final phase of tonight's uh, lecture. Um, so I'll introduce myself for those who don't know me. My name's Ian Harvey. I'm the retired uh, dean of the faculty here. I've been retired a year. I can recommend it. Um, <laughs> I want to thank Rosalind very warmly for her inaugural lecture. Um, she, she's illustrated some very important general points with her personal journey. Um, and, and I'd like to say how well UEA has done out of the University of Southampton. Because not only did we manage to uh, recruit Rosalind to come here, but we, her predecessor, uh, Val Latimer, who's in the audience tonight, was also from Southampton. And um, when I think back, when I first came to UEA, and the then School of Nursing Sciences was in the most awful accommodation over in Helston Hospital, which some people will remember. Uh, the transition to the current state of the School of Health Sciences is, is remarkable. Mm. Um, I first met Rosalind actually at one of those meetings about modernising scientific careers, which she mentioned. Uh, why I'd ended up on this committee in London, I have no idea, because I had very little knowledge of the subject. But I was sitting next to Rosalind, and within about 10 minutes, I'd realised that she knew everything there was to know about it. She'd also launched a programme in Southampton, clearly involving a great deal of diplomacy and need for persistence. And I'm afraid I rapidly came to the conclusion that she was somebody I'd like to poach from Southampton. And the rest is history. Um, the NHS can be the most frustrating organisation as well as the most magnificent organisation. And what Rosalind has beautifully illustrated tonight for me is that the university sector and people like Rosalind and the School of Health Sciences, the colleagues and the students within that, that school, need to be the catalyst for change. They need to be there constantly challenging the NHS, asking why. Why do organisations still compete rather than collaborate? Why do professions continue to, to overemphasise their boundaries rather than their commonalities? And so on and so forth. Uh, and, and I think that Rosalind, in her many illustrations tonight, uh, has illustrated that very well. So, Rosalind, thank you very much for your inaugural lecture. And can I just re mention that there are refreshments outside and everybody's very welcome to partake of them and I'm sure talk further to Rosalind. Rosalind, thank you very much. Thank you very much.